Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. This is chapter five, Advice from a Caterpillar. The caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? said the caterpillar. This is not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly. I, I, I hardly know, sir. Just at present, at least, I know who... I was when I got up this morning. I think I must have changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? Said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it any more clearly, replied Alice very politely, for I can't understand it myself. To begin with, and beginning... So many different sizes in a day is very confusing. It isn't, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps you haven't found it yet, said Alice. But when you turn into a chrysalis, as you will some day, you know, and then on after that into a butterfly, I think you shall be, feel a little bit queer about it, won't you? Not a bit, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different, said Alice. All I know is it would be very queer to me. You, said the caterpillar contemptuously, who are you? Which brought them back again to the beginning of the conversation. Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillar making such a very short remarks and drew herself up and said very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why, said the caterpillar. Here was another puzzling question, as Alice could not think of any good reason, and the caterpillar seemed to be very unpleasant state of mind, and so she turned away. Come back caterpillar cried after her i have something important to say this sounded promising certainly alice turned and came back again keep your temper said the caterpillar is that all As said alice swallowing down her anger as well as she could no said the caterpillar alice thought she might as well wait as she had nothing else to do and perhaps after all it might tell her a bit something worth hearing for some minutes it puffed away without speaking, and at last it unfolded its arms, took the hookah out of its mouth again, and said, So you think you are changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir, said Alice. I can't remember things as I used to, and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes altogether. Can't remember what things, said the caterpillar. Well, I've tried to say, how doth the little busy bee, but it came out all different, Alice replied in a very melancholy voice. Repeat, you are old Father William, said the caterpillar. Alice folded her hands and began. You are old Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age this is right? In my youth, Father William replied to the son, I feared it might injure the brain, but now I'm perfectly sure I have none. Why, I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and you have most grown most uncommonly fat, and yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason for that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple, but now at the use of this ointment, one shilling in a box, allow me to sell you a couple? You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose, and with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said the father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife, and that the muscular strength which it gave me to jaw has lasted the rest of my life. You are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eyes are steady as ever, yet you are balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I've answered three questions and that is enough, said the father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off or I'll kick you down the stairs. That's not quite right, said the caterpillar. Not quite right, I'm afraid, said Alice timidly. Some of the words have got altered. It is wrong from the beginning to the end, said the caterpillar decidedly. And there was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was the next to speak. What size do you want to be, it asked. Oh, I'm not particular as to any size, Alice replied hastily. Only one that doesn't change so often, you know. I don't know, said the caterpillar. Alice said nothing. 
She had never been so much contradicted in all of her life, and it was she felt she was beginning to lose her temper. Are you content now, said the caterpillar. Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Three riches, three inches is such a wretched height to be. It is a very good height indeed, said the caterpillar angrily, rearing itself up as it spoke. It was exactly three inches high. But I'm not used to it, pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone. And she thought to herself, I wish the creatures wouldn't be so easily offended. You'll get used to it in some time, said the caterpillar, and it put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. This time Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice and shook itself. Then it got down from the mushroom and crawled away into the grass, merely remarking as it went, One side will make you grow taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? One side of what? Alice thought to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as she had asked it out loud, and another moment it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which the two sides of it, as it was perfectly round. She found it was a very difficult question. However, at last she stretched her arms out as round as they would go and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. And now which is which, she said to herself, and she nibbled a little bit of the right hand bit to try the effect. The next minute she felt a violent blow underneath her chin as it struck her left foot. She was a great deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt she had no time lost, and as she was shrinking rapidly, so she set to work to eat some of the other bit. Her chin pressed so closely against her foot that there was hardly room to open her mouth. But she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left hand bit. Come my knee, my head, come my head's free at last, said Alice in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm after another moment when she found her shoulders were nowhere to be found, and all she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck, which seemed to rise like a stalk out of a sea of green leaves that lay far below. What can all that green stuff be, said Alice, and where have my shoulders got to? Oh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you? She was moving them about as she spoke, but with no result seemed to follow, except for a little shaking in some distant green leaves. As there seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, she tried to get her head down to them, and was delighted to find, at last, that her neck could bend as easily in any direction, like a serpent. She had just succeeded in curving it down gracefully in a zigzag, and was going to dive into leaves, which she found to be nothing but the tops of the trees under which she had been wandering, when a sharp hiss made her draw back in a hurry. A large pigeon had flown up into her face and was beating her violently with its wings. Serpent! screamed the pigeon. I'm not a serpent, said Alice indignantly. Let me alone. Serpent, I say again, repeated the pigeon, but more in a subdued tone, and added with kind of a sob. I've tried every way, but nothing seems to suit them. I haven't the least idea what you're talking about, said Alice. I've tried the roots of trees, I've tried the banks, I've tried hedges, the pigeon went on without attending to her. But those serpents, there's no pleasing them. Alice was more and more puzzled, but she thought there was no use in saying anything more till the pigeon had finished. As if it wasn't enough trouble hatching these eggs, said the pigeon. But I must be on the lookout for serpents, night and day. Why, I haven't had a wink of sleep in three weeks. I'm very sorry to hear you've been annoyed, said Alice, who was beginning to see its meaning. And it's just as I'd taken the highest tree in the wood, continued the pigeon, raising its voice to a shriek. And just as I was thinking I should be free of them, then at last... Needs comes wriggling down from the sky. Ugh, a serpent. But I'm not a serpent, I tell you, Alice said. I'm, 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 well, what are you, said the pigeon. I can see you're trying to invent something. I'm a little girl, said Alice, rather doubtfully, as she remembered the number of changes she'd gone through that day. A likely story indeed, said the pigeon, in a tone of the deepest contempt. I've had, seen a good many deal, deal of little girls in my time, but never one that was such a neck as that. No, no, you're a serpent, and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling next that you've never tasted an egg. Well, I have tasted an egg, certainly, said Alice, who was a very truthful child. But little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it, said the pigeon. If they do, why then are they... They're kind of a serpent, that's all I can say. This was as, such a new idea to Alice that she was quite silent for a minute or two and gave the pigeon the opportunity of adding... 
You're looking for eggs. I know that well enough. What does that matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? It matters a great deal to me, said Alice hastily, but I'm not looking for eggs. As it happens, if I was, I shouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw. Well, be off then, said the pigeon in a sulky tone as it settled down again on its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck kept getting entangled in the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while, she remembered that she held a piece of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one end and then at the other, sometimes growing taller and sometimes shorter, until she had successfully brought herself down to the right and usual height. It was so long since she'd been anything near her right size that it felt quite strange at first, but she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come, there's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are. I'm never sure whether I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got back to my right size, and the next thing is to get on to that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? As she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place with a little house, and in it was four feet high. Whoever lives there, thought Alice. It'll never do to come in to them at this size. Why, I should frighten them nearly out of their wits. So she began nibbling at the right-hand bit again, and she'd not ventured to go too near the house until she'd brought herself down to nine inches high.